As Dave said, I'm going to talk about topology, and uh, we're going to look at a, a number of different aspects of it. Uh, um, an interesting problem that's sort of considered the origin of the subject, the Konigsberg Bridges problem, and then also an application in geographic information systems. Uh, so first, I thought I'd just uh, give you an idea of what uh, topology is about, build a little intuition, and, and uh, work on uh, building up some of the math along the way. So topology is about shapes, and uh, we see a wide variety of different shapes there, a line, a Mobius band, a sphere, this thing, whatever that is, uh, torus, uh, the surface of a donut, a plane, a circle, and a uh, Klein bottle, other odd things. Uh, but again, the, the basic idea in topology is we study shapes and arrangements of shapes. So here we have two shapes, a torus and a circle, and uh, here's a, a few different ways they can be arranged. We just have the circle sitting above the torus, the circle running in the middle of the torus, the circle running around the hole in the torus. So those are same shapes but different arrangements, so they're of interest as well. Uh, functions between shapes, we can take a circle here and map it into the torus, winding it around like that. Deformations of shapes, here's a knot that through this sequence of pictures we're deforming to another knot. You can sort of see that we're pulling this piece over and then kind of twisting it up and straightening, straightening it out to that. But this, if you fill in the gaps, is a continuous deformation from this not to that, not there. So deformations of shapes are also of interest in topology. In topology, measures such as distance and angle are not important, but shapes, relative positions, and arrangements are. Topology literally means the study of position or location, and it was originally referred to as geometry of position. In topology, two shapes are considered the same if one can be deformed to the other. So there we see a deformation from a donut to a coffee cup. A donut is topologically the same as a coffee cup. Well, okay, here's a good question. If in topology we cannot measure distance and we cannot even tell the difference between a donut and a coffee cup, what good could this stuff possibly be in studying the world around us? And to understand that, we, it's good to understand sort of the notion or the difference between looking at things qualitatively and looking at things quantitatively. Topological tools and results tend to be qualitative in nature rather than quantitative. They identify possibilities without necessarily showing how, or identifying impossibilities. We'll see an example soon. They assert existence without necessarily showing where or assert non-existence. Uh, so why look at things qualitatively? Why uh, are qualitative analyses uh, worthwhile? Uh, on one hand, a qualitative analysis can identify possibilities or tendencies that then can be investigated more thoroughly, more closely with a quantitative analysis. On the other hand, if you have a model that's only roughly approximating some real-world system, it may be that only qualitative results make sense to even consider. A very rough approximation may not lend itself to meaningful results uh, with a quantitative study. Okay, so um, where did this stuff all come from? Uh, it's popularly considered that the field of topology, although it wasn't named topology at that time, started uh, in the mid-1700s when Leonard Euler was um, presented the, uh, with the Konigsberg Bridges problem. Uh, so here's a picture of the uh, town of Konigsberg, and uh, uh, in writing up um, his work on the problem, uh, Euler said, the problem, which I understand is quite well known, is stated as, as follows. In the town of Konigsberg in Prussia, there's an island called Nipoff, with the two branches of the river Pregel flowing around it. There are seven bridges crossing the two branches. So we can see that here. We see the branches of the river and seven bridges. The question is whether a person can plan a walk in such a way that he will cross each of these bridges once 
but not more than once. I was told that while some denied the possibility of doing this and others were in doubt, no one maintained that it was actually possible. So no one had been able to do it, and uh, they were asking Euler what the story was there. He went on to say that the problem, uh, while it certainly seemed to be belong to geometry, was nevertheless so designed that it did not call for the determination of magnitude, uh, nor could it be solved by quantitative calculations. So measurement, quantitative analysis didn't make sense here. Consequently, I did not hesitate to assign it to the geometry of position. So he's using all of the right notions about topology, or what was going to become topology 150 years or so later especially since the solution required only consideration of position, calculation being of no use. So, what I'd like to do now is let you all try playing with the Konigsberg bridges. I have four layouts here, the original Konigsberg layout and three others. And uh, I want you to see if you can find a path through Konigsberg crossing each of the bridges exactly once. There's something on the back side of this that we'll play with later, so hang on to this paper. So again, try each of these layouts and see if you can find a way to walk through Konigsberg crossing each bridge exactly once. Anybody uh, find a, a solution for the original layout? No. Nobody? <laughs> Nobody. How about the other three? Okay, so um, here's uh, the, the different layouts that we're looking at, and this is probably 
what you all found. Um, nobody had a solution on that one. With the bridge added, we were able to walk through town crossing each bridge exactly once. Uh, notice that we had to uh, begin and end in different places, but that's okay. We weren't told we had to uh, 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 begin and end in the same place. Uh, with a bridge removed, uh, same thing. We can walk through town crossing each bridge exactly once, beginning and ending in different places. With a bridge moved, you can see we took this bridge and moved it over here, we're able to walk through town crossing each bridge exactly once, beginning and ending in the same place. Uh, one of the things that this tells us here is the fact that we have seven bridges, or an odd number of bridges, uh, doesn't really matter, because with seven bridges like that, we couldn't do it, but seven bridges like this, we could. So it isn't just number of bridges, but it's the layout of bridges that's important, that's the issue here. Okay, so in three cases we were able to do it, in one we weren't, and, and again, the, the question that, that came to Euler was, is it possible or not? Now, we don't know whether that's impossible or not yet, we could just be very incompetent bridge crossers. So what we'd like to know, is there a way we can show mathematically that that's not possible? Anybody have any ideas what's going on? What makes the situations that work, work, and the one that doesn't, not? Yeah? Well, on either side, I number the amount of possibilities. You had the possibilities go across somewhere else. On that one, every one of them. So you numbered all of the land regions <laughs> with the number of bridges. He's, uh, he came with me. Um, <laughs> that, that attach the, the points of land. And this is exactly uh, uh, the, the way we can see why this works uh, when it does and why it doesn't when it doesn't. Um, so looking at these numbers now, what can you conjecture? What can you conclude about what's going on here? Uh, when we're on a point of land that's in the middle of our walk, it has an even number of bridges attached, and that makes sense. If it's not the beginning or the end of our walk, every time we get there, we have to leave on another bridge. So the bridges are going to come in pairs on places that are not the beginning or the end of our walk. Um, so you can have at most two regions with an odd number of bridges. One will be the beginning, the other will be the end, and we see that. Um, we have two points of land with an odd number of bridges. One's the beginning, uh, one's the end. Here, same <coughs> thing. Two points of land with an odd number of bridges. One's the beginning, one's the end. If they're all even, then we can walk all the way around to beginning and ending at the same place. And if there's more than two odd regions, it can't be done. And that's the solution. And now we know we weren't just incompetent, it's impossible. So uh, here's a summary of that. If all of the land regions have an even number of bridges attached, then there's a path through town crossing each bridge exactly once, beginning and ending at the same place. If exactly two land regions have an odd number of bridges attached, then there's a path through town crossing each bridge exactly once, beginning in one of the regions with an odd number of bridges and ending in the other. And if more than two land regions have an odd number of bridges attached, then there is no path through town crossing each bridge exactly once. All right, uh, and, and so another thing to, to consider here, uh, how did this all work out? Um, you know, with these uh, manipulations of the bridges, for instance. So we started uh, with every land region having an odd number of bridges. And so if you think about it, we can put a bridge anywhere between any two land regions and then get into a situation where we can cross all of the bridges exactly once, beginning and ending in different places. Um, so here we added the bridge over there, over where, over there making the south shore have an even number of bridges and the north shore have an even number of bridges. So we killed off two of the odd numbers by adding a bridge. We can also remove a bridge anywhere and we'll go from having four odd numbers to just two odd numbers. Any bridge can be removed. You have to be careful with the bridge moving thing though. 
um, because you want to change all four odd numbers to even numbers. So the way you move a bridge is you take one between two points of land, take it away so that makes those both even, and then put it between the other two points of land that makes both of those even too. And when you do that, then you have an arrangement where you can cross each bridge exactly once. All right, so we've already gone through this. How about this situation? Well, we don't have to try. All we have to do is count. We can see that there are two regions that have an odd number of uh, bridges attached. All of the rest have an even number of bridges. So we should be able to walk crossing each bridge exactly once, beginning in one, ending in the other. And there it is. All right. Konigsberg is, was a real place. Uh, it's now the city of Kaliningrad in Russia. And if you go into Google Maps, you get a picture that looks like this. And uh, you can see that there's still some bridges there. This one in essentially the same place as one we had before. One over to the island here as before, one here as before. Those other four bridges are gone, and this is some sort of super highway thing that just goes over the island. It doesn't let you get off on the island. Uh, but uh, you can see now we can cross, we can walk through, crossing each bridge exactly once. Whatever they did in their planning beyond 1740, uh, they did manage to set up Konigsberg so you can cross all of the bridges. Any questions about that, any of this so far? So uh, after Euler's work on the Konigsberg bridges problem, there, was, uh, there were a number of uh, uh, studies in mathematics that could be considered part of the geometry of position over the next 150 years. Um, little bits and pieces of mathematics were contributing to this theory. Uh, in the late 1800s, more and more work was being done studying uh, uh, aspects of mathematics that were related to this discipline. In the late 1800s, um, the name topology did first appear in a paper about uh, an aspect of geometry of position. And uh, over time, that name stuck as the name for this field of mathematics. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, mathematicians worked on putting an axiomatic foundation to the field of topology, uh, sort of work that was going on in all areas of mathematics, trying to find, develop foundational definitions for what uh, this uh, uh, field was all about, and then build the theory up from there, uh, working with definitions and axioms and, and, and proving results uh, about the field of topology. Uh, here's the definition of what a topology or a topological space is. Um, it was uh, first, or, or a, a, mile, a slight variant of this was proposed by Felix Hausdorff in, uh, I think it was 1914. And then this definition became the foundational definition for the field of topology. And research in topology throughout uh, the 1900s were based on this notion of a topological space and uh, for the most part was all abstract in orientation. I'll say more about that in a second. Um, I'm just showing this to you to show you that there's an abstract foundational definition of what a topology is. You don't need to get any meaning out of this at this point, uh, but I'll, I'll say a little bit about what these uh, ideas are about. Uh, but again, topology was studied as an abstract uh, branch of mathematics throughout the 1900s. But toward the end of the 1900s, uh, more and more people were realizing, hey, there's some interesting stuff in here that's useful in applications that, that we can use to study uh, problems, models, and systems, and so on. And so more and more in recent years, uh, tools of topology have been used uh, in, in a number of different applications. And I'm going to tell you about... Uh, topology being used in geographic information systems in a second. Um, so just to build a little bit of intuition about what that definition meant, what the idea of topological space is, uh, so the shapes we study in topology are topological spaces. 
And they're given a structure by a collection of open sets that are also called neighborhoods. So in the, in the definition, we have this notion uh, of an open set or a neighborhood. The neighborhoods, this is an important idea, give a notion of proximity that does not require a means to measure distance. So we talk about things being close together because they're in neighborhoods together, rather than because they're a short distance apart. We don't have distance, we just have neighborhood, and that's the structure that we work with. Um, here's a picture of the plane and some of its neighborhoods. So these are just all like open pancakes in the plane. Open meaning that the edge is not included. There are some of them, but at every point we have many, many of these things of all sizes. And this notion of uh, a neighborhood, again, gives us a sense of proximity, what it means to be close uh, in the plane. Now, for the application that we're going to discuss um, having to do with geographic information systems, two important concepts that we're going to look at from topology are uh, interior and boundary. So uh, let's get an idea uh, what that means. So a point, and we're looking at this point right here, is in the interior of a set if there's a neighborhood of the point in the set. So you see in this picture there's a neighborhood around that point that lies in this set A, so that point is in the interior. So I'm in the interior of a set if a bunch of friends around me are in the set with me, then I'm in the interior, sort of protected from the outside by my friends. A point is in the boundary of the set if every neighborhood of the set, um, of the point, intersects the set and its exterior. So every neighborhood has points in A and points outside of A. So I'm on the boundary of a set if every group of friends around me includes some that are in the set and some that are outside. Then I'm in the boundary of the set. And uh, I'm going to run through a bunch of examples here. Um, so here we have this uh, rectangular set A. Um, the interior is everything but the outer edge. And the boundary, this is the notation we use for the boundary, is the outer edge. Intuitively makes sense. Here's another set. Um, this is the region in between those, these two rectangles. So it's all of the dark shaded stuff here that's in A. The interior is everything in between the uh, inner rectangle and the outer rectangle, not including the rectangles. That's the interior. And the boundary is the two rectangles together. All right, here's a set, like the rectangle, but now it has a stick attached. Well, the interior is the same as the interior of that rectangle. All of the guys that have a neighborhood that are in the set with it. Notice that none of the stick guys are in the interior, because if you take a neighborhood about any of those guys, it's not going to sit inside the set A. It's going to have stuff outside it. So the interior is the same as the interior of the rectangle. The boundary, then, is the outer boundary, uh, outer edge of the rectangle, along with the stick. Um, if we have just a line segment in the plane, it has no interior. Stand at any point on the line segment, take a neighborhood, it's got stuff outside the set, so it's not going to be in the interior. The whole segment is the boundary of the set. So is neighborhood always conceptually circular? Um, like are you always at the point in the center of the circle? Not necessarily. For what we're looking at and thinking about, it, it suffices just to use that as our intuition. But uh, the neighborhoods can really have any shape as long as they've got stuff kind of all around us. But it has to be all around us. Yeah. Um, this set is the rectangle A with a, uh, just a segment down there. And the interior of the set is, again, the interior of the rectangle. The segment is not in the interior, uh, but it is in the boundary along with the outer edge of the rectangle. If we take the whole plane as our set, everything is in the interior stand at any point, there's a neighborhood around you that's in there. And there's nothing in the boundary. There's nothing that's, that's sort of on the edge that has a neighborhood that intersects 
the plane and, and what's outside the plane. There's nothing outside the plane. That's our universe. All right, so the whole plane is the interior. The boundary is empty. Now we get into some weird things here just to show you how weird it can get. This is not an accurate picture of what I'm trying to describe here, but you get the idea. We take all of the points in the plane, uh, so we think of Cartesian coordinates here, both of whose coordinates are, are rational numbers. Now, uh, uh, you may know that the rational numbers are, are sort of densely distributed throughout the real line. Uh, so when you look at pairs of them, we're going to get them densely distributed throughout the plane, but there's going to be lots of points that aren't in that set A. Again, it doesn't look like that. It's not a nice lattice like that, but, but you've got the idea they're all over the place. Um, the interior of the set of rational uh, of points with uh, rational coordinates is empty. Because if you stand at any point, both of whose coordinates are rational, and look at a neighborhood around you, you can have points that have coordinates that are irrational, because there are irrational numbers close by all the rational numbers. So even though I'm in the set A and I have both my coordinates rational, there's no collection of nearby friends that are like that. The interior is empty, and everything is in the boundary. Every point in the plane, put a neighborhood around it, you're going to find points both in A and outside of A. So that makes everything in the boundary. Yeah, Dave? Could you just remind us the difference between rational and irrational numbers? So a rational number is one integer divided by another, two-thirds, five, six, 134, 75ths. And no matter where you stand on the line, there are rational numbers close by, but, and also irrational numbers. So they're both sort of scattered uh, uh, densely throughout the line. And then when you look at this sort of construction, both sort of scattered throughout the plane. Does this sort of, uh, do you play with this sort of scope of the neighborhood ever? Like, do you end up moving through a sort of scale? Am I making any sense? Um, do, what, neighborhoods, do neighborhoods have kind of, I would, I would imagine that if you're working in a set sort of thing, you have this sort of standard neighborhood size that you're working with. But I would imagine that the topology of something would change this, this measurement of the interior or the boundary, depending on the size of the neighborhood that you're working or, with. Or the, the, the type of the neighborhood. Okay. Uh, so that's a very good question. You can have a plane with different neighborhoods. You say, I'm going to change my neighborhoods. I don't like these circular neighborhoods anymore. I want a different kind of neighborhood. And it could completely change the topology. So the structure of the topology, what is interior, what is exterior, or what is boundary, depends strongly on the choice of neighborhoods. This is sort of a standard choice that we're looking at, where the neighborhoods are all these, these open uh, circle things. Um, you can work with other shaped neighborhoods and end up with the same topology. If instead of open circles, we, had, we work with open rectangles, we get the same structure. So different types of neighborhoods can give you the same underlying topological structure, but could give you different ones as well, depending on the neighborhood. So that's a good question. Uh, the structure that you have is, is, is uh, 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 very closely dependent on what you're choosing as the neighborhoods. Um, and the good old Mandelbrot set, some of you are in chaos and fractals and may have seen the Mandelbrot set. Um, the interesting thing there is, you know, when you look at a picture of it like this here, in this uh, outer edge that seems to be the boundary and seems kind of one-dimensional like, a, a curve or a bunch of curves, um, it was proven uh, in 1999 that it actually has dimension two. So it's more area-like than curve-like. Uh, this is just a rough, approximate picture of what that thing looks like. Uh, those of you who have explored it realize it has uh, incredible detail at all levels of magnification. And uh, so the, the boundary of that is, is kind of interesting, kind of weird. All right. Uh, so that's the idea behind interior and boundary, and we're going to work with that in an application of ge to geographic information systems that I'm going to show you here. Any questions uh, at this point? All right. So here we go. Application to geographic information systems. A geographic information system is a computer system used to store, manipulate, and retrieve geographic data. It's a 
simple way we can think about it that, that uh, makes a lot of sense. Someone working on a geographic information system could ask a question like this. Suppose you're, you're studying wetland regions in state parks. And you may want to know, all right, what are all the wetland regions that are contained within a state park in this area, uh, the, in this region that I'm investigating? So you ask the GIS, which, which wetland regions are contained within a state park? And you expect the GIS then to be able to give you a good answer. All of these. How does it find them? Uh, a system capable of addressing such queries must be able to keep track of the geographic objects perform operations on them, and unambiguously understand relationships such as contained within. If you're going to ask the computer to do something and tell you what everything is that's contained within something else, it better have a good understanding of what that means. Uh, not only that, uh, the system much, must match our intuition. What it thinks contained within means ought to be what we think contains within means. Uh, and our understanding of such objects, operations, and relationships. So uh, it's a, a, an interesting challenge if you think about it. How would you design a computer system to be able to handle queries like that? In such a system, the stored information about the relationship between two sets must be independent of a pictorial representation. You look at those two sets and say, oh, all right, they meet on the boundary. They meet right here. But they may not. If you look closer, it may really look like this. You don't want to be misled by pictures in the work and the investigations you're doing. You want the information in the GIS to be independent of pictures. <clears throat> so um, this is about topological spatial relations in GIS, and the goal establish a mathematical framework for distinguishing relationships, telling different relationships between sets, and a means for implementing the framework uh, in a software system. And so here's the idea. We have this notion of what we're going to call the intersection value, and we're going to play with this in a second. So be on your toes here. Uh, so for two sets A and B, like in this example here, we're going to look at these four intersections. The boundary of A intersect the boundary of B. The interior of A intersect the interior of B. And then boundary A intersect bound, inter interior B. Interior A intersect boundary B. And we're going to assign a 1 or a 0 to each of those whether there's something in that intersection or not. So for instance, 1, 1, 0, 1 is coding this relationship here, telling us that the boundaries intersect, and they do, right here. The boundary of A intersects the boundary of B. That the interiors intersect. There are points that are in the interiors of both sets. That um, the uh, boundary of A does not intersect the interior of B. Here's the boundary of A, and no points in the boundary of A are actually in the interior of B. And that the boundary of B intersects the interior of A. There are points in the boundary of B that are in the interior of A. So there's a way of coding that relationship between those two sets. How many different possible codes are there? Keep going. Sixteen. It will be two to the fourth power because we have two choices for each entry. So two times two times two times two. Here's 12 of them. So um, 1, 0, 0, 0 says the boundaries intersect, but nothing else does. So there's an example of that picture. Um, 0, 0, 0, 1 says the only intersection we get is between the boundary of B and the interior of A. And we had to use this line segment type thing to get that to work. B has no interior. So the intersections involving the interior of B will be zeros. The boundaries don't intersect, but the boundary of B does intersect the interior of A. Um, one, 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 where everything uh, intersects. Zero, 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 where nothing intersects. Uh, here's an interesting one. The only way to get it so that 
the interiors intersect and nothing else does is you have to use the whole plane for both of your sets A and B. Uh, other funny things happen here. To get a 1, 0, 1, 1, we need to attach a stick to B and a stick, that stick is on A, and that stick is on B, and so on. So you can see examples of, the, of 12 of the uh, possible intersection values. What about the other four? Flip over your <laughs> Konigsberg bridges, work, and see if you can sketch examples of the other four possibilities. All right, so uh, here are uh, my four versions of, of those guys. And uh, you see the 0, 1, 1, 1, 1 um, is, um, has that sort of that idea. Uh, we have, it's not clear from the picture uh, what the structure of that is, but B has a rectangular hole in the middle of it, and A is just a rectangle. Uh, so we needed to have some sort of hole in our um, set or holes in, in each in order to accomplish that. Uh, but again, here, uh, the B is the region between this rectangle and this one, and A is this rectangle and everything inside it. So we get the boundaries of each intersecting the interiors of the other, so that's those two ones, and the interiors intersect, but the boundaries don't. Um, this is good here, the, to get A equals B, um, if you're going to work with rectangles, they have to be the same rectangle to, to get, uh, sorry, not to get A equals B, but to get uh, the 1, 1, 0, 0. Um, you need to have the two rectangles equal. Uh, this one over here, we needed to have those extra little sticks uh, uh, thrown in to, to get the boundary of A to penetrate the interior of B without crossing the boundary of B as well. Uh, one thing to notice about this guy here and the, the relationships in general is if you switch the roles of A and B, uh, these two numbers switch. So um, notice here we have 1, 1, 0, 1, the B in the inside, the A on the outside, and here's uh, the role switched in that 0, 1 switched to a 1, 0. So to get the 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, you could take the 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, and switch the roles of A and B. And that's what happens here. The A's inside, the B's outside. All right, so we can uh, get all 16 of these possible intersection values uh, by building our sets appropriately in the plane. But there were some weird examples that we had to, to work with, like uh, a stick attached to, or a stick is part of B but not connected to B. Um, you know, some other um, oddities like um, here A and B had to be the whole plane. Um, another thing with sticks attached and so on. So a natural question now to ask is, or a couple of them, if we, on, if we allow only nice examples, and we'll talk a little bit more about what nice is going to mean for us, do we get a restriction on the possible intersection values? We throw out all those sticks. Can we say there's no way of getting those intersection values? Not only that, and this is what's important for working with a geographic information system and having it give us meaningful information, can we draw any conclusions about the relationship between two sets from the intersection value? For instance, very simply, here, if we know that that intersection value is 0, 0, 0, 0, then we know A and B are not going to intersect no matter what. So that's the sort of information that we want. Can we go further with that and draw other conclusions just from the sequence of four numbers? Uh, so those are our questions. And the answer is, in both cases, for both of these questions, the answer is yes provided we work with an appropriately defined class of nice sets. So the next step is to decide, well, what are these sets going to be that we're going to work with that are nice? And uh, our definition is of what we call a spatial region, and we're going to require two things of it. 
that the boundary of the set is going to be the same as the boundary of the interior of the set. And we'll see in the pictures here what sorts of things that excludes. And the interior of the set is a connected set. Um, I haven't told you what connectedness means in topology, but there is a topological definition. But your intuition won't steer you wrong here in what we're going to do. But uh, as was suggested uh, here, um, you know, th th there's something wrong going on or, or there's something different going on if our sets are disconnected. And that's something that we're going to require. So these guys here are all nice sets. They're all spatial regions. The boundary of the set is the same as the boundary of the interior. The interior is nice and connected in each of those examples. This guy here is not a spatial region. We can't attach a stick like that because when you take the boundary of the set, you get the rectangle with the stick, and you take the boundary of the interior, you only get the rectangle. They're not the same, so it's not a spatial region. This guy here, the interior is not connected. The interior is going to be these two uh, rectangles open without this part that's sort of attaching them together. That's not a spatial region because the interior is not connected. This is not a spatial region. The boundary of the set, which is the stick itself, is not the same as the boundary of the interior because the interior is empty and so the boundary is empty as well. So these sorts of things are going to be okay. These aren't. Where do we go with this? <clears throat> well, we can prove a mathematical theorem that tells us the sorts of things that we want to know. If A and B are spatial regions, then the only intersection values that are possible are these here. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So if we work with spatial regions, we can't get all 16 um, intersection values. We only get nine of them. Not only that, from the intersection value, we can say something about how the sets sit in relation to each other. And again, this is really important in geographic information systems because we want to draw conclusions about the relations between the set from the code that we're using, that we're operating with in the system. For instance, if we have a 1, 1, 0, 0, we know that the two sets have to be equal. That's good information. So, the OpenGIS Consortium is a group of software developers who have jointly established industry standards for GIS software. They've adopted a topologically based function that expands on this idea of the intersection value for coding how two geographic areas lie in relation to each other. And they've adopted a language for describing the relationships. In a GIS, if you say uh, A is disjoint from B, it means we have this intersection value and it means that the two sets don't intersect. If you say A touches B, it means we have this intersection value and the two sets intersect where the boundaries intersect and so on. So this is language that's used in the GIS that's associated with these codes that tells us about these relations between the sets. And so then finally back to the wetlands question. A GIS user would ask uh, for which wetland regions A and B is the relation between them A equals B or A is within B. And the GIS will look for and returns regions A and B that have these intersection values and then tell us, independent of the picture, what regions are satisfying uh, the requirements of, of the uh, question. And uh, that's uh, a nice little application of topology and GIS. And that's it. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to entertain them. How do, you, how do you assign the numbers to the map? I mean, uh, uh, so that the computer can figure it out. In other words, you just have the map. Now, what do you do with the map? Do you have to interpret the map? Yeah. Right. So, so there are, uh, I'm not that familiar with that part of the work, but um, there are, there are ways. So you have to input the region in some way, some geometric way. And then there are um, uh, algorithms that will take the regions uh, see how they're input and determine the code for them. So it can tell uh, when two regions are going to overlap given the way um, they're constructed geometrically in the, uh, in the system. So that's a good question. That's a big piece of it. How do we go from the, the regions to the, to the codes? But it's work like that that's involved in doing that. Yeah? 
Are there applications of this type of math in the construction of uh, chips, computer chips, the very complex architectures of computer chips? Um, yes. Um, the, um, so a, a simple models of computer chips or electronic circuits are, are graphs. So you have uh, uh, points connected by edges. So you can think of electronic components connected by conducting materials. And um, the study of graphs uh, or, or the structure of graphs is also a part of topology. And they're interesting questions like which graphs can you draw in the plane? So which circuits can you create without having to have overlaps and crossings and so on? And there are ways of, of answering that sort of question. But um, that uh, electronic circuit design does often use tools from topology to, to answer questions like that. Anything else? Yep, done. Do, do people apply this to like people? <laughs> I, I, I can't quite come up with the analogy to interior and boundary, but like when or when groups interact with other groups, they could interact in different ways. Does anybody do any social topology sort of stuff? Well, I don't know. I mean, there, there's there's the, uh, the whole idea of so, social network models that are graph models, and, and um, there are interesting questions there. I imagine there's some topology in there. I'm not familiar with anything direct. Um, directly involving topology, uh, answering questions like that, but but the whole idea of, of the structure of social networks is, is a, a mathematical area that's investigated, and, and uh, uh, definitely graph theory, again, nodes and edges plays a role there. Yeah? So in the early 1900s when topology was being sort of axiomatized, was that just a sort of phase of mathematics which was pure and abstract, or were there any applications at that point that were motivating that work? Not the ax axiomatization. <coughs> Excuse well, me. Well <laughs> um, I, I, that wasn't motivated by application. That, that was definitely motivated by, you know, let's put a structure on this. But all along the way, uh, you know, there were applied questions that were part of the study of um, uh, the geometry of position. And uh, knot theory actually got started, um, I don't remember the whole story, so I don't want to say too much and, and get it wrong, but um, it was thought that molecules were knotted uh, tubes of ether or something like that, and, and it was thought that, or atoms, it was thought that if you could study and understand all possible knots, you could classify then uh, atoms, but it was realized that the, that, that didn't work. But uh, there were uh, a, a number of investigations uh, throughout the 1800s of different sorts that were applied oriented um, that, that touched on aspects of, of uh, geometry of position. But, but really, once the ball started rolling on uh, the abstract theory of topology in the, in the 20th century, uh, a lot of the connection with applications were just, were just lost uh, until they started coming up again. And, uh, 70s, 80s, so on, chaos theory being uh, an important uh, motivator there. Yes? Uh, are there any applications of this to uh, neural networks and large switching s uh, systems so that when you get a signal from one particular area, you can map out the possible topology of signal going out and signal return? I mean, it would be really interesting if you could do that. Yeah, I imagine. I mean, the, the question sounds like a, a, a topology question, yeah. so. Uh, I just wanted to yeah, know I, whether people had applied that there. I, I don't know. I don't know, but that certainly sounds like uh, something that could use some of these sorts of tools. How'd you get into this? <laughs> wow. Make it sound like it's weird or anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, topology. You really want to hear the story? Oh, 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 I'll tell you the story. It started when I was a sophomore in high school. Um, and uh, we're going to find something new and different. Is it graphics for the story? Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it Rachel Dutton's song? 
<laughs> I'll try to make this brief. Uh, but let's see. So when I was in uh, geometry in high school, we had to do uh, projects uh, in our class. <clears throat> and um, actually, you're going to get into all kinds of trouble here now. But uh, So I didn't do a project have any, having anything to do with topology. Uh, but this is actually a picture of me. Let's see. We got to go ahead a little bit. 1971, giving my first mathematics presentation. <laughs> this is in my high school geometry class, and I was talking about conchoids, which are a uh, some sort of geometric structure that, that I don't really remember anything about. In fact, I don't even know if I really did that, but uh, that is me. Uh, so, but two of my classmates did talks about topology, and they were, um, oops, based on <coughs> this chapter in a Time Life book on ma mathematics, Topology the Mathematics of Distortion. And it talked about donuts being the same as coffee cups and, you know, all this cool shape stuff. This guy here, um, I, I used to do this, but the vest and jacket no longer fit, um, <laughs> takes a vest off from under the jacket without uh, taking the jacket off. Uh, so, but this really interested me, and I decided I wanted to learn, uh, I, I wanted to do that, uh, I want to learn more about topology. Uh, so I had it in my mind that this was something I was going to do, and at the time I went and found articles like in Scientific American uh, that were, had something to do with topology, and I read them and mostly didn't understand any of it, but had it in mind that that's what I wanted to do. When I was in high school, I was good in math and science. I didn't like English. I didn't like history. Everybody told me, become an engineer. So I went to college to become an engineer. And I spent a couple of years uh, in engineering. And uh, the end of the math courses that were required for engineering was near. And I started to panic. I want to study math. I want to study topology. So I went to my engineering advisor. and. I uh, said to him, I asked him, uh, how can I get more math into my, uh, into my program here? And he said, well, there's a couple of applied math for engineers courses that you could take. And I said, well, I'm, I, I'm interested in uh, abstract algebra and topology. I'd like to take courses like that. And he said to me, why do you want to do that? And so I never went back and talked to that. Uh, man again. <laughs> and I transferred from engineering to mathematics, and I started studying mathematics at that point. Uh, I took a topology course as an undergraduate, and I was in heaven, and uh, the rest is history. Long history, but that's, that's the answer to your, to your question. So it all. that book's in our library. <laughs> it's, it's cool. It's cool. Be inspired by it. I was. So thanks, Don. For, for asking that question. <laughs> Anything else? It's getting near dinner time for you guys, right? All right, well, thanks uh, for coming and uh, being a audi good audience. I hope you have fun.